We hear about cults all the time, in the media, in books, in documentaries. It's a fascination for many people, one that often poses questions such as why do people join, who would join one, and why would people follow someone so blindly? This case in particular is perhaps one of the most gruesome and horrific acts of abuse by members of a cult ever reported. Even worse is that the victims in this case just happen to be two innocent children who suffered abuse from the hands of the person they are meant to trust the most their mother. Hi, I'm Brandy and this is Killer Bites. Our story begins with Clara Marova. Clara was born in 1975 and gave birth to two boys, Jacob in 1997 and then Andre in 1999. She met the father of her children while at school and the two of them were married for a few years. However, Clara suffered from severe mental health issues. And at one point, her odd behavior and delusions became too much for her husband to handle. He ended up leaving Clara. Clara had struggled with mental health issues most of her life, and it's said that her sister Katerina did as well. Clara had shown signs of schizophrenia at a young age, a mental disorder that can cause delusions, hallucinations, and lead people to lose touch with reality. After her husband left, Clara moved in with her sister, Katerina. She studied pedagogy at university, and it's there where she met Barbara Skrlova, a person that would soon change the course of her life. Barbara Skrlova suffers from a disorder called hypopituitarism. Hypopituitarism is a hormone deficiency that can stunt one's growth and make a person appear much younger than they are, childlike even. Barbara would use this as a tool and a manipulation tactic throughout her life. Often pretending to be a child, despite the fact that she was a grown woman, she would come across as non-threatening, something that would enable her to later pose as a victim of abuse, rather than who she really was, an abuser. Clara met Barbara at university, where they were both studying. When Barbara met Clara, she introduced herself as Annika. At the time, Clara believed that Barbara was much younger than her real age of 33 due to her disorder. It's unclear, however, what age Clara believed Barbara was, but Barbara was at the time posing as a young teen attending college. Clara and her sister Katerina took Annika in when Annika claimed she needed a place to live because she was facing abuse in her current home. It's unclear if that was true or not. Likely not, as she was a master at tricking people. Either way, Annika, also known as Barbara, moved in with the sisters and she quickly became a part of the family. Clara even had plans to adopt Annika at one point. It was Annika who then introduced the two sisters to the Grail movement, a cult that her father, Joseph, belonged to and was one of the leaders of the Czech sector. Clara and her sisters grew up religious, so it's not surprising that they fell prey to or joined a cult. In fact, it's been said that Clara believed that she was meant to carry out a divine purpose in the name of God. This was likely also due to her schizophrenia, which she was later diagnosed with formally, so joining a religious movement was not far off. The Grail movement was created in the 1940s. The movement believed that if they did good deeds on God's behalf, they would then be awarded with access to heaven in the afterlife. They also believed that just being a part of the movement would grant them access to walk freely on this earth, free of punishment for any crimes they committed. The Grail movement is known to worship and take its lead from a 19th century mystic. After Barbara moved in with the two sisters, Barbara became increasingly weary and jealous of the two young boys, Clara's sons. She started making up lies about them and the trouble they had caused. Barbara convinced Clara and her sister to punish the boys for their wrongdoings, going so far as to get the boys to confess their sins on paper, absolving Barbara of any blame. This instruction to abuse the boys didn't just come from Barbara though. Every cult has a leader. Sometimes those leaders are more pronounced seeking attention, and sometimes they are hidden and protected. Either way, they are typically master manipulators that its followers will blindly follow. In this cult, it seems as though the leader went by the name of the doctor. 
The doctor, speculated to be Barbara's father, was never seen in person, but would dictate instructions to Clara on how to abuse the boys and when via text messages. Clara then began to abuse her sons, horrifically and often. Clara would later place the blame on Katerina and Barbara, claiming that they coerced and manipulated her into committing these acts. Even so, Clara still continued to abuse her own sons for an entire year, manipulated or not. The abuse these boys suffered started with Clara locking her youngest, Andre, who was seven at the time that this started, in a cellar, chaining him to the walls so that he was unable to escape or move. Additionally, he was gagged in the mouth to avoid anyone hearing him. But it didn't stop there. During the trial, the boys admitted that they were whipped, faced attempted drownings, and had cigarettes put out on their flesh by their mother and others. Both boys were locked in the cellar off and on, sometimes put in cages. When down there, they weren't allowed to use the restroom facilities, forcing them to sit amongst their own feces and urine for days to weeks on end. The boys would also be required to stand for days on end, not permitted to sit down. They were forced to hurt themselves using weapons like knives and were sexually abused by other members, including family. The abuse escalated so far to the point of cannibalism. Clara, her sisters, and others skinned the boys and ate their raw flesh in pieces. It's reported that the boys were even forced to eat their own flesh as well. The boys endured this torture for over a year before they were discovered. By a stroke of luck, the two boys were saved by police after a neighbor decided to install a baby monitor in May 2007. This monitor was meant for the neighbor's own newborn child, but one day the wires got crossed and this monitor happened to tap into the feed of another monitor close by. The neighborhood watched footage of a young naked boy chained to a wall, a monitor that Clara kept to watch her son. This led to the rescue of the two boys by the police as the neighbor immediately reported his sightings to the authorities. It was later discovered that Clara would happily watch this monitor to watch the torture of her sons as if she was watching a sports game on TV for her own enjoyment. When the police arrived, they found the two boys in a horrific state, along with who they thought was a 13-year-old girl at the time. Later, it would be discovered that she was not 13. Instead, she was a 34-year-old woman, Barbara. When Barbara was discovered, she told officers that her name was Annika and that she was the boy's adopted sister. She claimed to have been abused just like them. Annika was then placed in an orphanage in the Czech Republic and shortly after escaped to Norway. Through the help of an unidentified woman, Barbara was able to pose as a 13-year-old boy named Adam. The woman allowed Barbara to use her son Adam's passport. This passport gained Barbara Barbara entry into Norway. While Barbara was in Norway, she shaved her head, taped down her breasts, and enrolled in a primary school called the Marianless School near Oslo under the same name, Adam. Barbara successfully tricked everyone in the school into believing she was a young boy for about four months, including classmates, teachers, etc. But in January of 2008, Barbara's charade was over. In her attempt to stay under the radar, Barbara made a big mistake. She escaped from a boy's home in Oslo where she was staying. This then created chaos and panic amongst the staff. The staff called the police in search of the missing young boy, and the ripple effect led to a nationwide search for young Adam leading to the discovery of the true identity of Barbara when she was eventually found in Tromso. Barbara was then arrested by authorities and brought back to the Czech Republic to face trial for the 2007 abuse allegations against Jacob and Andre. Teachers from the school Adam attended were interviewed afterwards. They were asked if they were aware of anything strange going on with Adam, or if this had come as a total shock. Ingerd Eriksson, the Marianless school's principal, was quoted saying, Looking back, we can say that we wondered about Adam's behavior, but this is not easy to know. Children at this age are very different. While there were signals, and Adam definitely didn't appear to be a normal child, how would anyone have guessed that he would in reality be a 34-year-old woman? In fact, Barbara's manipulation tactics were so outrageous that they inspired the movie The Orphan, a horror film that was made in 2009. 
In the movie, a young girl is adopted by her family, but when she starts to pose a threat to their newborn, they discover that she's not a child, but in fact a 30-year-old woman posing as a child. A story not far off from Barbara's. A trial was held where Clara, Katerina, and Barbara all faced punishment in relation to the abuse. Apparently there was a debate as to if the trial should be public or not, but it was ultimately deemed public, allowing journalists inside the court. Clara cried to the court as she confessed to her crimes, admitting that she had abused the boys. However, as said before, she did not take sole responsibility. She placed blame on her sister and the other cult members, claiming she had been brainwashed into doing so. While that may be true, and knowing Barbara likely took advantage of Clara's mental health disorders, it does not absolve Clara of the horrific damage she has permanently caused to those two young boys. As most abuse cases go, justice never feels like it's served. But in this case, many people believe that the sentences these women faced for their acts of violence against two innocent children was far too short. In October 2008, a court in the city of Brno issued sentencing to six of the involved parties. Clara was found guilty on accounts of repeated abuse with severe cruelty, grievous bodily harm, and depriving the boys of their freedom. Clara received nine years for her crimes and served her time in a high security prison. Her sister, Katerina, was found guilty on the same counts, along with giving false testimony, and was sentenced to 10 years. Barbara only served a small amount of five years. Jan Sklura, Barbara's brother, was sentenced to seven years, along with Hannah Basova, also referred to as Auntie Nancy. One other man with little information on how he was connected, Jan and Turek, received five years. However, the two boys' three main abusers proved to be their mother Clara, Katerina, and Barbara. Barbara even ended up getting out early on good behavior. Her whereabouts are currently unknown. Hopefully she isn't out there somewhere masquerading as a child, but rather living the life of the adult she is. The doctor was never identified or discovered, and although Clara revealed during the trial that she had received instructions from such a man, this led to speculation in court. She later revealed that this man was located in Azerbaijan. Still, the court had a difficult time coming up with a cult-related motive. In the judge's closing remarks, he said, the abuse had amounted to the deliberate destruction of a child's soul, but said there was no proof of a larger cult involvement, despite indications. When looking into the involvement of Barbara's father, who went by the name of Joseph, they found that he had since left the Grail movement to form a breakaway cult of his own. He also had business dealings in Azerbaijan. It is speculated that he was in fact the man they called the doctor. However, it has still not been proven to this day as his whereabouts are unknown. The takeaway from that being that while these women were members of a religious cult, they might have been operating on their own agenda, despite claims of being brainwashed into these acts. The prosecutor during the trial told the court that because of the abuse these boys endured, they were subject to a multitude of disorders. The boys suffered from mood disorder, various phobias, sleep impairment, growth regression, and emotional deprivation disorder. It's unclear where they are now, but hopefully they have found peace in their new life. That's it for today. Thanks for listening to this episode of Killer Bites. Tune in for more on our channel. This next tale I personally find really chilling. It's about a man named Mark Latensky, and he loved the app Grinder, but not for the usual reasons, because it allowed him to lure people into his basement in Michigan. People went there thinking that they were in for a good time, but instead, they found ropes, chains, and a frying pan used for unthinkable purposes. It all starts in Swartz Creek, Michigan, just outside of Flint and a little over an hour northwest of Detroit. It's a small place home to about five and a half thousand people. And it's where Kevin Bacon, not the actor, but our Kevin Bacon lived. He was 25, born in 1994, and a local. He attended Swartz Creek High School and the University of Michigan Flint, 
where he studied applied psychology. But what Kevin really loved was hairdressing. He graduated from Sharp's Hair Academy in Grand Blanc and worked at Uniquely You Salon in Swartz Creek. Kevin was close to his parents, Carl and Pamela, his sister Jennifer, and he had lots of friends, cats and a dog. And he was known for being funny, charming and quirky. His friends always said he was supportive, uh, a cheerleader, and a shoulder to cry on. However, Kevin had his issues with self-harm and body image. He wasn't the biggest fan of Swartz Creek and dreamed of moving to Chicago. The story takes a dark turn in December 2019, starting on Christmas Eve. Kevin, who had been on Grindr, left his home after work to meet a man. He told his roommate he'd be back later that night, and he never returned. The next day, when he didn't show up for a family Christmas breakfast, fears began to rise. Searches for Kevin started on December 26th. On December 27th, Kevin's car was found on Miller Road in Sports Creek. His phone was there, still logged into all the apps, and the police could trace his final messages to Eliaka Sky Lucas. If they had known his real name, they would have found numerous police reports on him because he was actually Mark Latunsky. So who was Mark Latunsky, also known as Alica Sky Lucas on social media? Born in 1969, a native Michigander, he had a long history of mental health issues. He was diagnosed with chronic major depression, psychotic features, adjustment disorder with depression and anxiety, paranoid schizophrenia, and borderline personality traits. He was highly intelligent, attended Central Michigan University and Iowa State University, and he was a chemist by profession. He was married twice, once to a woman named Emily, with whom he had four kids, and later to a man named Jamie Arnold. They met on Grindr, and initially things were great, but the relationship deteriorated due to Mark's refusal to take his meds and his involvement in the BDSM lifestyle. Mark Latunsky wasn't new to this kind of behavior. He had lured men to his home on West Terrell Road, Bennington Township, before Kevin Bacon disappeared. There were two incidents, one in October 2018 and another in 2019, where men ran from his house calling 911. These earlier incidents, while not resulting in fatalities, were harrowing encounters that foreshadowed his capability for more heinous crimes. In October 2018, nearly two and a half months before Kevin Bacon's disappearance, a 48-year-old man named James Carlson experienced a terrifying ordeal at the hands of Latunsky. Carlson, who had traveled from New York to Michigan specifically for an encounter arranged through social media to have a BDSM interaction with Mark, found himself in a perilous situation. After falling asleep in Latunsky's car, he awoke to find himself tied up in Latunsky's basement. In a chilling detail, Carlson managed to escape by cutting the straps with a butcher knife, an item alarmingly out of place in such a setting. Then he fled the house and called 911, but shockingly, no charges were pressed against Latunsky and the incident was seemingly dismissed. The pattern of alarming behavior continued when Six weeks later, on November 25th, 2019, a similar incident occurred. This time, a 29-year-old man managed to escape from Latunsky's house and called 911 while fleeing. The victim was found wearing nothing but a leather kilt and reported that Latunsky had chased him. He sought refuge at a neighbor's house, pleading for help and protection from Latunsky. Again, when police arrived, Latunsky managed to convince them that the encounter was consensual and part of a sexual role play, leading to no legal action being taken. This lack of police intervention after two such alarming incidents highlighted a concerning oversight and possibly a prejudiced response due to the nature of the encounters. In both the instances, nothing significant happened legally. These events were later criticized as it seemed the police didn't take the case seriously possibly due to the victims being gay men involved in BDSM activities. These previous instances were not only early warning signs of Mark Latensky's dangerous behavior, but also a stark reminder of the potential consequences of unchecked mental health issues and the importance of thorough police investigations. Latensky's ability to repeatedly convince authorities of the innocuous nature of these events, despite their clear danger, 
raises serious questions about the response to such situations, especially in the context of unconventional sexual lifestyles. The police's failure to act on these earlier events ultimately paved the way for the tragic fate of Kevin Bacon and left a community grappling with the aftermath of these overlooked warnings. The police later tracked missing Kevin to Mark's home through messages on Kevin's phone. Arriving there on December 27th, Mark initially introduced himself with a different name, but eventually let the police in, and they made a horrifying discovery in the basement. Kevin Bacon was found chained to the rafters by his ankles, completely naked and deceased. Mark had stabbed Kevin in the back, slit his throat, and committed gruesome acts of mutilation. He was later arrested and charged with Kevin Bacon's murder and the mutilation of a dead body. As Mark's trial began, new information began to surface about his past. His history showed a list of grievances regarding his mental health. Mark was known to stop taking the medication prescribed to treat his mental health illnesses. According to the records from the 66th District and the 35th Circuit Courts, a motion filed August 22nd by former wife Emily Latonsky to suspend Mark Latonsky's parental custody states that he was diagnosed with major depression, paranoid schizophrenia, and traits of a personality disorder back in 2010 and 2012. It was also revealed through Freedom of Information Act requests that police were called to Mark's home for 10 incidents in which Mark was involved dating back to 2013. Twice in February 2020, Mark had to be taken to the local hospital from the Shiawassee County Jail because of apparent medical issues. A Michigan State Police trooper was dispatched February 18th to the Shiawassee County Jail after Mark was found unresponsive in his cell, police said. Shiawassee County District Judge Ward Clarkson ruled on October 5th, 2020, that Mark was mentally fit to stand trial. Mark's attorney suggested this wasn't a murder case and even requested the court consider it an assisted suicide, but the court declined. Toxicology reports showed antidepressants in Kevin's bloodstream. However, text messages between the two showed that Kevin Bacon had wanted Mark Latunsky to ensure his safety after their encounter. Despite his claims, Mark was charged with the murder and mutilation of Kevin Bacon. He initially pleaded insanity, claiming that Kevin had asked him to end his life, which led to him stabbing Kevin in the spine and later slitting his throat. A pulley system was used to hang Kevin by his ankles in a grotesque act that Mark claimed was to expedite Kevin's death. Mark Latunsky's trial was mired in complexity. His attorney, Doug Corrin, argued that this was not a straightforward murder case suggesting assisted suicide as a possible angle. However, the court disagreed. Yet, Mark's public defender, Doug, indicated that Latunsky was assisting Bacon in suicide, pointing to the antidepressants found in Bacon's bloodstream. The narrative took a turn when text messages revealed Kevin's concerns for his safety, contradicting Latunsky's account. Mark initially claiming to be assisting in the suicide, but the evidence suggested otherwise. The case continued to unravel as more details emerged. In September 2022, as the trial was gearing up, Mark Latunsky, against his attorney's advice, pled guilty to all charges, including the murder and mutilation of Kevin Bacon. He admitted to using a knife to stab Kevin and later removing and frying Kevin's testicles in a frying pan. Disgusting, revolting, sad. And the court found him guilty of first degree premeditated murder. Despite his attorney's belief in the potential for a successful trial, Mark's guilty plea led to a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In January 2020, hundreds of people gathered in Kevin's honor outside Swartz Creek High School in his memory. This tragic case ends Mark Latunsky's reign of terror, but it also highlights a complete failure by the police. When two prior victims escaped from Latunsky's house, alleging they'd been enchained, the police's response was lackluster, possibly influenced by the victim's sexual orientation and the nature of their encounters. This negligence allowed Latensky to continue his predatory acts, leading to Kevin Bacon's horrific end. 
It's a grim reminder of the importance of taking every report seriously, regardless of the circumstances. And this concludes our story of the tragic fate of Kevin Bacon and this disturbing acts of Mark Lutonsky. It's a case that underscores the importance and need for unbiased police force, as well as the vigilance both online and in the real world, especially when exploring something vulnerable like BDSM. It's a wonderful thing to explore, but make sure to do it safely and consensually with those that you can trust. Thank you for joining us on this journey to the darker sides of human nature. Stay safe, stay informed, and always be aware of your surroundings. Again, I'm Louie, and I'll catch you next time right here on Killer Bites. Our story begins with the birth of Jason Vukovic on June 25th, 1975 in Anchorage, Alaska. More than 40% of Alaska's population lives in Anchorage, but the number of people doesn't exceed more than 288,000 based on the 2021 census. Jason was born to a single mother with his father not in the picture. He also had a brother named Joel. Eventually, his mother married a man named Larry Lee Fulton, and at four years old, Larry adopted Jason and Joel and took them in as his own. Jason's mother and stepfather were incredibly religious and attended church multiple times a week. But this good, church-going Christian persona was hiding terrifying abuse at home. Larry abused his stepsons, not only physically, but sexually. Larry would beat Jason with a custom wooden 2x4 with a double-handed grip. He would use this to smash the back of his stepson's legs. When that wasn't enough, he whipped them with his belt to the point where they couldn't even stand. It was horrifying, violent, and obviously painful for Jason and his brother. Late at night, Larry would often have intimate prayer sessions. However, this private time turned into a front for molesting Jason. Jason and Joel shared a bedroom growing up, and Larry used this as an opportunity to further take advantage of his adopted sons. Over and over, he would come into their room and molest them in their beds. Joel would later speak out about his stepfather's abuse, saying that he would make sure to go first so that Larry would leave Jason alone. After the abuse had been occurring for some time, Jason decided to tell his mother about everything Larry had put him and his brother through. At the time, Jason was just a kid. He didn't have the language to truly explain everything he was thinking and feeling. He just knew he had to tell someone what was going on, anything to get it to stop. However, he was worried that no one would believe him. The one person he felt safe to turn to was his mother. Sadly, his mother would not be a safe person to turn to. Jason bravely approached his mother in the kitchen to explain what his stepfather had been doing to him and his brother. He was met with complete disbelief. Jason's mother became furious and refused to take her son's accusations seriously. Instead, she forced Jason to sit on a stool in the kitchen and wait for Larry to come home from his day at work. Then he would confront him about the situation. Obviously, this did not go over well. Jason sat on the kitchen stool, recounting the graphic abuse in front of his abuser and his mother. Larry fervently denied all of Jason's accusations and played it off as though he was making it a bigger deal than it needed to be. Larry even used an excuse along the lines of, I was just curious about the boys maturing. You would think that after a weird comment like that and her son's pleading that Jason's mother would push away her doubt. Sadly, she refused to believe Jason. Nothing ever came of the confrontation and the boys were stuck in the house, forced to endure several more years of Larry's physical and sexual abuse. Joel ran away from home when Jason was around 16 years old, leaving him to fend for himself. This absolutely broke Jason's heart. He was devastated that his brother would leave him to suffer all on his own. I completely understand the hurt and betrayal Jason must have felt and totally sympathize with him. On the other hand, I can see from Joel's perspective too. He was a young kid, just like his brother, terrified of his stepfather's abuse and desperate to find a way out. When no adult believes the horror you say you're enduring, especially your own mother, I can see how it would be difficult to find a reason to stay, even if that means leaving your one and only brother behind. However, Joel wouldn't make it on his own very long. Eventually, he was found by the police and taken into custody as a runaway. 
When questioned by law enforcement officers, he took a huge leap and came forward with stories of abuse and the terrifying household he and his brother had endured. Thankfully, this time, someone listened to his pleas. An investigation into Larry's actions began, and the testimonials from the boys were obviously damning for him. In 1989, he was charged with second-degree abuse of a minor and molestation. However, the state of Alaska and Superior Court Judge Carl Johnstone decided not to remove Joel or Jason from the home or to put Larry in prison. Instead, they suspended the three-year prison sentencing as a part of Larry's plea deal. No steps were taken to ensure Jason and Joel's safety. They were not removed from the home, and neither was Larry. Larry was allowed back into the house, free to terrorize his stepsons, and this time it was even worse. Even after having a chance to see it end, the legal system made it possible for Larry to abuse Joel and Jason without repercussions. If that wasn't bad enough, the extended family did not make the time after Larry's release any easier on the boys. Certain family members went out of their way to mock Joel and Jason for stepping forward with the truth against their stepdad and going to the police. I'm sure there was a mix of resentment and disbelief on their end, Regardless, it made the situation even more embarrassing and hurtful to the boys. And on top of that, the trial was making rounds in the news cycle of the area. The boys were still so young, and the poking, questions, and inevitable bullying they received from the situation was too much to handle. They were pulled out of school, and Joel, Jason, Larry, and their mother moved to a new town further away. This time, the hope was that they wouldn't know anyone in the area, and the news cycle would be so far away, the boys and Larry could get on with their lives. Even though they were in a new place, that didn't mean the trauma suddenly disappeared. Jason made it his new mission to find a way out of the house and away from his abuser. He often snuck out of the house to hang out with friends. It was better being out there than at home. But he knew in the long run that the only way to get out of that house permanently was to save up enough money and run away. During this time, Jason took up several odd jobs in an attempt to raise money for his escape. Somehow, Larry and Jason's mother found out about his sneaking out and attempted to punish him. As a gotcha, they stuffed all of his clothes into trash bags and threw them on the front porch for Jason to discover once he got back from sneaking out. When Jason returned home, they locked the house and hid all of Jason's identification papers. At 16 years old, with barely any money and no ID, Jason Vukovic snuck out of his window and ran away from his abusive, unsupportive family. Somehow, Jason managed to get a plane ticket and fled to Washington. Unfortunately, with no driver's license, social security card, or any other identification, there was no way to get paid. His employers couldn't identify him, and therefore he had no way to support himself. Because of his age and his lack of resources, there weren't a lot of options to get on his feet. At this point, Jason had to turn to stealing, petty theft, and other small crimes to get by. Unfortunately, he was only able to keep this up for so long without getting caught. And then these actions turned into a building rap sheet. At one point, he landed in juvie because there was nowhere else for him to go. Jason was released after a few months, but his problems still were not solved. He had no money, no family to turn to, no resources, no place to live. The list went on and on. Because of this, he had no other option but to return to a life of crime to find housing, food, and clothing. He had nobody to turn to and no one he could trust, so he figured it was easier to go on the road, traveling from state to state, trying his best just to survive. In a letter Jason wrote to the Anchorage Daily News several years later, he reflected on this time of his life. He stated, being a thief and a liar fit nicely with my lack of self-worth. My silent understanding that I was a throwaway, the foundations laid in my youth never went away. In 2008, Jason made the decision to move back to his home state of Alaska. There, he continued to gain more and more marks on his record, consisting of stealing, possession, and assault of his then partner. However, he denied all allegations to any assault charges. After spending some time back and forth behind bars and in dead-end jobs, Jason found a fairly stable job. However, this calm period did not last for long as he lost that job and found himself in jail once again. Jason was released in 2016 and used the first half of this period to settle down again. 
He was trying to find joy and peace in living a simple life. But just as things started to calm down for him, the rumor mill started buzzing around town. Apparently, there were several men in the area who were a part of the sexual predator registry, specifically towards children. These rumors consisted of grown men nearby who had abused, taken advantage of, or molested young children. At that point, something bubbled inside of Jason, and all of the unresolved trauma and angst that still lived inside of him found a brand new target. Jason decided to put some real time and effort into researching these men in the area. He pulled up the registry for sex offenders in the area, wrote down their addresses, and made a plan to avenge the children they had harmed. He believed that someone needed to stand up for those kids, much like he needed someone to stand up for his younger self. On the morning of June 24th, 2016, Jason Vukovic headed to the house of 68-year-old Charles Albee. Charles's information was posted on the online registry. Jason learned that in 2003, Charles was convicted of second-degree abuse of a minor. Jason knocked on the door to the house, his hair long and dark, wearing a black leather jacket. Charles answered the door, and Jason used a stern force to push his way through the threshold. He demanded that Charles sit on his bed and stay quiet. Charles followed Jason's orders, but was met with multiple open hand slaps to the face. After scaring him senseless, Jason used the opportunity to steal a few items from the home. Soon after, he fled the scene with the possessions in his pockets. Charles immediately grabbed his phone and dialed 911. He recalled the appearance of the man, tall, long, dark hair, black leather jacket, and a notebook in hand. Charles then remembered the notebook a little clearer. Inside were several names and addresses written on it. With no other witnesses or leads, the police couldn't do much else besides take down information for any future break-ins. And oh, would there be future break-ins. On June 27th, 2016, Jason planned another break-in. This time, he brought along two women. The group of three showed up to the house of 25-year-old Andres Barbosa at four in the morning, pounding feverishly on his front door. Once again, Jason's hair was down and he wore the same black leather jacket. Jason and the two women forced their way past the threshold and into Andres' house, where they forced him to shut up and sit in a chair. Just like Charles, Jason found Andres' information on the online registry of offenders in the area. Andres was convicted of possession of child pornography in 2014. One of the women pulled out her phone and began recording the entire interaction. Jason wound his fist and punched Andres several times, shouting violently, effectively terrifying him. What was different about this break-in, besides the extra people, was that Jason brought along a weapon. His choice? A hammer. Jason pulled out the hammer, waving it around, screaming at Andres that he was going to bash his dome in, and that he was there to collect what he owed. Although he was talking a big game, Jason never used the hammer on Andres. It was more of a prop to taunt and scare him. After roughing him up a little bit, the group decided to steal a few items from Andres' house, including his car. Quickly after this, Jason and the two women fled the scene. Andres dialed 911 to report the assault and break-in, and the police were positive that these two incidents were related somehow. What they couldn't seem to understand is if there was any motive besides theft. With a little more digging, detectives found some common threads between each break-in victim. Each of these break-in victims were on the National Sex Offender Registry and lived around the same area. Jason wasn't finished on his quest for vengeance. On June 29, 2016, yet another break-in was reported, and this time the police were quick to respond. At one in the morning, Jason was caught breaking his way into a man by the name of Wesley Demarest's home. Wesley was woken up by his roommate pounding on his bedroom door. As he went to answer, his roommate, with a panic in his voice, said, someone's trying to break in. By the time Wesley made it to the door and out of his room, Jason was standing in the hallway. His long, dark hair flowing, the black leather jacket, and a silver hammer in his hand. Jason had zero intention of hurting or involving his roommate and told him to go somewhere else. The business he had with Wesley didn't concern him. Just like Charles and Andres, Wesley was a part of the online registry. In 2006, he was convicted of sexual abuse of a minor. What made Wesley's crime particularly personal for Jason was that Wesley assaulted his kindergarten-aged granddaughter. If that wasn't bad enough, he only served a mere nine months in jail for his crime. 
This was unacceptable to Jason. Jason began his same technique as he did with the others, demanding that Wesley sit down on his bed and shut up. However, this time, Wesley refused. When this didn't work, Jason demanded that Wesley get down on his knees. Again, Wesley refused Jason's command. Frustrated that Wesley wasn't cooperating with his request, he slapped him across the face several times. Unlike the previous break-ins, Wesley was a large man. He stood over 6'2", 300 pounds, and was not as easy a target as the men before. Wesley used his height and strength to push and fight back against Jason. Feeling like he was running out of options, he opted to use something Wesley didn't have, a weapon. Jason cried out, I'm an avenging angel. I'm going to met out justice for the people you hurt. And with a powerful swing, he smashed the hammer into the side of Wesley's face. The hammer made contact with the side of Wesley's skull, breaking skin immediately, and his face started gushing blood. The force of Jason's swing was so powerful that it fractured Wesley's skull. He was knocked out immediately and fell to the ground. With Wesley out cold on the floor, Jason took the opportunity to, once again, steal a few items, including a personal computer, and flee the scene. After that, he jumped in his car and drove off. As Jason fled the scene, Wesley continued to lay on the floor in the back room, red fluid gushing from his skull. By the time Jason had jumped in his car and sped off, the police were on their way to the location. If Jason had just left, that meant he was still close by, or at least in the area. They were looking for a suspicious vehicle, or even a speeding one. It would be easy to detect. While paramedics arrived on the scene, law enforcement officers split up to scope out the scene and search the area for Jason's potential whereabouts. Shortly after, law enforcement officers were surprised to find Jason casually sitting in his Honda Civic. When the cops approached the vehicle, Jason was completely calm and seemed pretty fine with sharing information. Inside the vehicle, they saw a hammer, the notebook with addresses and three names crossed off, and some of the stolen goods from Wesley's house. Obviously, he was arrested on the spot and brought in for questioning. The officers recorded their initial interview with Jason. In this, Jason said that's where he said that he received orders from someone to attack sex offenders off the registry. He stated that he personally would never seek out any violent action towards anyone unless his handler, Sherry, told him to. At this point, the cops weren't sure where to go from here with Jason's mental state. Was Sherry even a real person? According to Jason, Sherry worked for the CIA. None of what Jason was saying was making any sense, but he was so certain and calm when he delivered it. The officers were convinced that Jason was experiencing mania, which is common in those with bipolar disorder. Despite their suspicions, Jason stated several times during their discussion that he was not a violent person. He found no joy from hurting anyone. He claimed that he was out there doing hard work out of concern for kids. He kept bringing up how, while he didn't want to take matters into his own hands, it's what he felt and knew to be the right thing to do. Later on, Jason was charged with 18 counts of assault, burglary, robbery, and theft. I typically use these terms interchangeably, but all three actually are seen differently through the eyes of the law. For it to be considered theft, the defendant has to take control of a tangible asset without consent, with no intention of returning. For it to be considered robbery, the defendant has to take an asset through coercion, intimidation, or force. For it to be considered burglary, the defendant must enter a building to remove assets or property without coming into contact with the owner. Before his sentencing, Jason wrote a letter to the Anchorage Daily News detailing his entire life story and warning others not to follow in his footsteps. He said, I thought back to my experiences as a child. I took matters into my own hands and assaulted three pedophiles. If you have already lost your youth, like me, due to a child abuser, please do not throw away your present and your future by committing acts of violence. Initially, Jason pleaded not guilty, but decided to accept a plea deal from the prosecution. They gave him the option. If he came forward and pled guilty to first-degree attempted assault and a count of first-degree robbery, they would dismiss over 12 other charges. Through his letter to the Daily Mail, he spoke up about what he believed his punishment should look like. He said that he would plead guilty to any combination of charges they wanted to throw at him, all under one condition. His sentencing was to be equal in length to what each of the pedophiles served in prison for their horrific crimes towards children. 
Jason said, and I quote, so the guy that raped his own daughter received two years and change, I'll serve his two years and change. The guy that was convicted of molesting his 10 month old granddaughter got three years in prison. I'll serve his three years. So now we're at five and a half years. The child pornographer did two years or did a year in a program or something. So I'll do his. I'll even serve three years in prison that you suspended for the monster that made me. So I'll do nine years, six months, run that right now. I'll sign, I'll plead to whatever you want. While this was an incredibly noble offer and an incredible statement to make, the courts did not take these caveats lightly. In the end, Jason Vukovic was sentenced to 25 years in prison in 2018. Initially, his sentence was 28 years in prison, five years suspended and five on probation, but the plea deal worked to lighten his sentence. To know that Jason served more time than each of those he assaulted shows to me personally a perfect example of just how messed up the United States justice system really is. There are a few different ways to look at this situation. One, Jason should have never taken the law into his own hands. What makes him the person to go after these abusers? Two, Jason did what the law couldn't do. He was only giving these men a taste of their own medicine when the legal system let them slide. Three, Jason broke the law, but these men had it coming. Personally, I can understand each of these takes. Jason broke in, assaulted these men, and stole some of their things. Is that breaking the law? Yes. But did these men abuse young children and essentially get off with a slap on the wrist? Yes. If we can see that Jason did something wrong, why can't the justice system hold those men accountable too? This case hit the news and many people in the state of Alaska found what Jason did to be admirable. Even in prison, several guards and other prisoners shared their solidarity with Jason and the actions he took against those men. It was discovered to no one's surprise that Jason had suffered from severe PTSD. However, this was never taken into account during his trial and sentencing. Thousands of people signed an online petition showing their support for Jason, asking for his release, or at the very least, a lighter sentence. Even though this was brought forward, the judge decided that his vigilante actions would not be tolerated in their community. In the end, Jason agreed. He urged people to not follow down the same path that he went down. In his letter, he stated, I began my life sentence many, many years ago. It was handed down to me by an ignorant, hateful, poor substitute for a father. I now face losing most of the rest of my life due to a decision to lash out at people like him. To all those what have suffered like I have, love yourself and those around you. This truly the only way forward. People have been very vocal with their support for Jason and the want for his release. A petition online has over 27,000 signatures asking for exactly that. Whether or not that petition will do anything is still up in the air, but it does show that the community, even a small part of it, is rallying behind him and wants to see him back in the outside world. When Jason was a child, there wasn't a whole lot of available language for the situation he was enduring. The general tone was to stay quiet and suffer in silence. Since his imprisonment, Jason has had a lot of time to sit and reflect on his life and his trauma. In an interview with Jason behind bars, he commented on how many other inmates had similar experiences to his. Childhood trauma is a massive factor when it comes to involving yourself in a life of crime. He was never given a helping hand or pointers on how to approach life. He was thrown into the real world and expected to survive whilst dealing with so much unresolved hurt. In a direct quote from Jason, he said, I was a thief and a liar for many years of my life. You never stopped to think why. Instead of help, he got thrown behind bars. While in prison, Jason began to receive letters from all kinds of people across the world, talking about their similar experiences. To his surprise, all kinds of people carried the hurt with them. Jason went on to say that during this time in prison, he's learned a lot about himself, but also other inmates and their difficult upbringings. He noticed that the majority of men who are doing time for charges or violent behavior usually have difficult, tumultuous childhoods. It makes a lot of sense to me. If during your formative years you constantly felt unsafe, like you were walking on eggshells or didn't have access to resources, you would either lash out or do whatever you could to survive. In the United States, we have the second highest incarceration rate in the world, with just over 1.68 million people behind bars. As for Jason now, he spends most of his days writing. 
In fact, he recently finished co-writing a book with a professor at UMass called Legacy of Retribution. For the future, he plans on working towards making real legislative change, especially when it comes to protecting children from unstable, violent homes. He believes that the justice system needs to be completely reworked to help those who cannot help themselves. And that, my friends, is the end of our story. I would love to hear your thoughts on all of this. Do you think Jason was justified in his attacks of those abusers? Or do you think he should have stayed out of it? Let me know in the comments down below. Until next time, I'm your host Brandy, and this is Killer Bites. Be sure to check out our channel for more true crime stories and subscribe for more cases like this one.